welcomed me with open arms, and it's just been great uh, seeing the loving community that y'all are. Um, y'all been a blessing to me. I thank y'all for that. Yeah. 
next few weeks as we look at these different judges that you appointed the God that through this we will see you we will see your character we will see your faithfulness in our lives and Father I pray that you would be with us in these next few minutes reveal yourself to us in a new and refreshing way ask all these things in your name Amen, Amen. Well, if you would turn your Bibles to the book of Judges, we're starting a new sermon series for the next few weeks. We're going to be looking at specifically five different judges. And uh, we're going to start um, with Ehud, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But if you think about it, the book of Judges, some of you are maybe familiar with it, some of you may not, and that's okay. But um, it's really a book about faith. And what does it mean to be a human being in a faith relationship with God? Back in Genesis, God started a covenant of faith with Abraham. And through this covenant, there were basically two promises, real simply, that there would be a promise of a people and a, a promise of a place. Okay? But after Abraham, the patriarchs, the patriarchs died. So that's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember what happened to the Egypt, I mean to the Israelites? They were sold in slavery, right? They spent 400 years in slavery. Then Moses delivered them. Then they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, right? Then finally, after all that, and generations have come and gone, they get to enter that second promise, the promised land through the leadership of Joshua and Caleb. And this is where, then, Judges begins. Because starting in chapter 2, I just want to read this kind of uh, introduction, I guess, to understand the kind of the atmosphere, the environment, but what is going on with Judges. Check, check this out. Judges chapter 2, starting in verse 8. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. And they buried him with the, within the border of his inheritance in Timnath, Henris, in the mountains of Ephraim on the north side of Mount Gash. Now check, now look at this verse 10. When all the generation had been gathered to their fathers, that means after they all died, 
Another generation arose after them. We did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. You know, let me pause. The sad thing here is that a whole generation, when they died, their faith kind of died when Joshua died. Because you had an entire generation that, that, that got so spiritually complacent, they did not teach the next generation their faith. Not just, I'm talking about doctrine and knowledge. They did not live their lives. They did not pass it on to the generation below them. And as, as when Joshua died, is as if a spiritual death kind of occurred in the hearts of this generation. And then when they all died, because they did not teach the generation below them, then you had, it says, Scripture says, that a whole generation rose who did not know the Lord nor the works that He had done for them. My friends, this is scary. Because so many times we can get so wrapped up and settled in and very complacent in our own spiritual life that we do not disciple those not, who are not just chronicle, chronological age-wise younger than us, but those who are spiritually young. And when we do that, when we become more centered and narrow-minded on things that really do not matter about church, about the Christian walk, and we become arrogant and prideful, we neglect an entire generation. We neglect maybe the calling of God upon our lives. What happens when that happens? Churches die. An entire generation grows up not knowing the Lord. And they turn away from Him. Probably seeing that now. We've probably seen it for a few generations, actually. And this is this is the status. This is kind of like what's happening. So God is giving us this kind of picture of the heart of the people at this point. So what happens? God raises up a judge. But in verse 11 and 12, we read this too. Then the children of Israel did evil because of this, because they didn't get taught the ways of the Lord. And their faith was not passed down. What's, what's the consequence? Verse 12. 11 and 12 and 13. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were, what? All around them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. I want you to just let that weigh on you for just a moment. The Lord is angry with them. We don't talk about the anger and the wrath of God very much. But he gets very angry about sin. It says they forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Asherahs. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. Why do you think God is so angry? First, sin is fundamentally a relational violation. It is willful disobedience against an unlawful God. And sin is when we use our freedom to violate our relationship with God, when we violate our relationship with others, and we violate really our relationship with ourselves. And also, God's angry. The second thing is because idol worship, no matter what form it comes in, is really a shortcut around faith. Instead of trusting God in a journey of deep inward growth of our spirit and our soul, we, we use idols. It's a shortcut around the cost of growth to find the easy and the pleasant life. We want, we want what's quick and fast, and so we 
we idolize different things and make them the ruling part of our lives. My friends, this morning though, we're going to start this journey and we're going to see the faithfulness of God when a people group, including us, can be so unfaithful. And we see the mercy of God, but we also see, we'll see the justice of God poured out. In Judges chapter 3, starting at verse 12, we are introduced to Ehud. And the children of Israel again did evil on the side of the Lord. Well, that will be a pattern that you will see for the next few weeks. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Then he gathered to himself the people of Ammon and Amalek, went and defeated Israel, and took possession of the city of Palms. So the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years. But when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them. Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjaminite, a left-handed man. It's a southpaw. And that will come in... It's interesting. This, this, this is a great story. I'm just telling you. He's a southpaw. By him the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. So, what do we know about Ehud so far? Not much. Other than he's left-handed. And God has raised him up. And what you're going to see is that here's the plan. The plan is this. It's not a very good plan, really. And I'll tell you why. But Ehud's going to try to go into this fortified city. He's going to get past their homeland security. He's going to get past the Secret Service agents. And he's going to approach the king. He's going to kill the king. And then he's going to make his way back out without getting killed himself. And then he's going to then raise up the rest of Israel to defeat his army. Sounds like a great plan, right? Sounds like it's going to happen. It's almost like, I've been joking about this before, but this story, as we read on, is kind of like, if you're familiar with the video game Assassin's Creed, some of you are in this room or younger, it's like, this is Ehud the assassin. And he's going to take this king out. Do or die. <coughs> go big or go home. Kind of thing. And so God raises up this man. And this is Ehud's plan. And so we look at verses 8. Let's skip down. He makes this, uh, he makes this dagger. And it says that in the scripture that he hid it on, on, on him. So he he kind of so he's left-handed, so he probably he drew from here. So it's like going through airport security and thinking you're really going to get away with just having a nice little long knife. And it's gonna be okay. This is like this is what Ehud is thinking. And so he's he's got it on him. And look at verse 18 and 19. And when he had finished presenting the tribute. And so he's already gotten in, and they have this tribute, and it's kind of like a gift, an offering, okay, uh, so that he could come see the king. And so when he finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who had carried the tribute. So there were some others with him, but he said, get out of here, basically. And this is a, an interesting verse. But he himself turned back from the stone images that were at Gilgal. He was looking at these things and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. He said, keep silence. And all who attended him went out with him. Let's stop there. So he has, he's let his help go. And now on his own, he turns and he faces these Moabite idols. I want, you, I want you to kind of grasp this for just a, a split moment here. Remember, these are the idols that had pulled the people into sin. These are the idols that represent the very things that have pulled people away from the faith and their trust in the Lord God. 
And Ehud is facing these idols that haunt the people of Israel. My friends, first thing I want to talk about is a life of faith. That a life of faith asks us to face the idols that tempt us. We all thirst for a deeper life of meaning, purpose, and intimacy with God. But we are all tempted to meet those needs externally by like different idols in our lives. I just want to go over a couple of them briefly in broad categories. One is materialism. And this can look like all kinds of things. We get sucked into trying to dull the pain of feeling insignificant by buying things, by desiring more things, by wanting to be successful, to be seen by others as great, as popular. And we try to use materialism as a way of to dull the pain. Another way is by manipulation. In our attempt to feel secure, we try to control people around us. Have you, have you tried to do that? Be honest. Have you ever tried to control people around you for your own benefit, for your own personal gain? That could be another idol that tempts us. Addictive and compulsive behaviors, whether it's substance abuse or pornography or whether it's just compulsive lying and greed. We try to use things to fill our void and it's a false intimacy. My friends, sin most often results from trying to meet a legitimate need in a destructive way. So here's the questions you need to ask yourself. What are you really after? What do you really long for? And then you ask God, how can I meet this need in a legitimate way without an idol that is tempting me? These Moabite idols became sin. The Israelites. And Ehud's looking at these as he's about ready to go and face the king. And he's reminded of the sin. In verse 20 in chapter 3 it says this. Now this is where it's starting to get really good. So Ehud came to him. Now he was sitting upstairs in his cool private chamber tell you what that means in a moment. Then Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. So he rose from his seat. <coughs> then Ehud reached with his left hand, took the dagger from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly, the king's belly. It's, and this is what scripture says. And yes, it, and you may have to look at your Bible. It is in the Bible. It says, even the hilt went in after the blade and the fat closed over the blade so he did not draw the dagger out of his belly and his entrails, that means his intestines, came out. Then Ehud went out through the porch and shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. That's graphic for a Sunday morning. But I'm telling you, this is something straight out of a movie. <laughs> And I want you to just think about what you, not think about too long, but what he just did. <coughs> he took that entire dagger, killed him, left it in him, and walked out and shut the door. Now, you have to think, Ehud has no guarantee that his plan is going to work out. I mean, he's, 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 there is no turning back now. There is no turning back with Ehud, right? He just, he just killed the king. And this could go really, really bad for him. But my friends, the second thing is, you know, we had a life of faith that asks us to face the idols and tempt us. The second thing, though, is that a life of faith means risk for the sake of spiritual growth. This is the application I want us to understand. That you cannot grow spiritually in the grace of Jesus Christ when we just sit and we become complacent and we become comfortable. Because God calls us to a life that is not necessarily comfortable, but one that involves risk. The one that includes valleys in our lives. 
and pain. So Ehud goes on. And check out, so verse 25, excuse me, 24. So when he had gone out, Eglon's servants came to look, and to their surprise, the doors of the upper room were locked, so they said he must be attending to his needs. That means using the bathroom. So they, says, so they waited till they were embarrassed. That means the servants. And still he had not opened the doors of the upper room. Therefore they took the key and opened the doors, and there was their master fallen dead on the floor. Let's read on. But Ehud had escaped while they delayed and passed beyond the stone images and escaped to Sirah. Listen, there's those stone images again. Another reminder of the sin. And of course, these stone images in ancient times, I mean, these were kind of geographical like points. Like, hey, you know, when you're giving like driving directions, you need to turn right at the red bar and at the such and such, you know, like it's these stone images, people knew where they were in location of the city, and it was a, a geographic point. And so as he was running past this, it says, and it happened when he arrived in verse 27 that he blew the trumpet of the mountains of Ephraim and the children of Israel went down with him from the mountains and he led them. Then he said to them, follow me for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him, seized the fords of Jordan leading to Moab and did not allow anyone to cross over. And at that time they killed about 10,000 men of Moab, all stout men of valor, not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. <coughs> 80 years. You know, at this point, the Israelites seem defeated. And so you see this story as Ehud, he's running out, and he's blowing a trumpet. It's probably not the best plan in the world, but he's blowing a trumpet, and it's kind of like, he looks at his people and he says, go get them. Yeah. Go get them. The Lord has delivered them into your hands. Come on. And, and well, how would you feel? Like you'd be like, mm, I don't know about that. But it says that they got up and they went <coughs> and they defeated the Moabite army. And not a single one was left standing. They were outnumbered outmanned and they killed them all because of the power of God was on their side and they obeyed what the Lord wanted them to do and so my friends is this this is such a, a fascinating story and I, I urge you to, to read and you read, read it again if you wanted to this afternoon but to think about this, that many times our faith, even in the midst of crisis, when we feel like all hope is lost, and, and maybe right now, today, you feel like your career is lost, uh, your, things really are bad at school, um, maybe you have you know, there's issues with a parent, you have a relationship with friends that's going sour, I don't know. Maybe you're just struggling personally. Maybe you're struggling as a parent. Maybe you're struggling as a spouse. My friends, that is even within those times, may we be reminded of God's faithfulness to give us the courage and strength to persevere for the sake of others. See, Ehud was raised up <laughs> to kill a king to be an inspiration as a life that was being obedient to be an inspiration to a, a people to say that God is on your side and he already has won victory now come follow me Jesus says to us today come follow me obey me 
I will lead you. I will lead you into a life that's abundant. A life that is full of my grace and my love. A life I've promised you my Holy Spirit. I've given you Him. Now come and live a life, and it's risky, of faith. And I will be with you until the end. My friends, Christ will be with you until the end. May we have this hope and this desire to follow Him always. Let me pray for us. Father, I just thank You for the story of Ehud. And there's so much here, but it's just simply that God, that You would teach us to be bold, to, to take a life as a risk, that we will not forget also, Lord, that even in the, in the previous passage, that, that we do not forsake discipling those behind us. And that we would train and that we would live lives that are glorifying to you to rise up other generations. We thank you, Jesus for what you're doing in this church and among the people here. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jonathan, for bringing the word of the Lord. In Judges, in this sermon series, as we all continue, all these judges who delivered God's people from the results of their sin. But as I invite you to stand one last time this morning, I'd like to remind us all that Jesus Christ is the ultimate judge. I want you to stand up. Christ is the ultimate judge. He's taken the result of our sin. It was my sin that held him there. But the sins that held him on the cross, he took to the grave and he left them there. And this morning we've we've walked through the gospel and we've heard of the judges and of uh, one of the judges, Ehud, and how Christ fulfills that. This truth of the gospel, I, I want to leave with you all, and I hope that you hold on to it so tightly um, that nothing else pushes it away. And ask that you will be filled with the Spirit of God to to obey, to be obedient as Christ was. But ultimately, it's Christ who does away with the consequences of our sins. We can never escape them on our own. And this is the truth we will do as His church.